what is the elevator speech for a job developer? I don't think we can do an elevator speech for that type of thing. That's like a search really? committee. Really? We can That's a search really? committee. It, imagine the elevator is for 50 floors. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a very oh, really low. low we're no, I want to see, what was the 11 seconds? Was it the 11 seconds? Do you, gotta, do you get in the elevator? How you, long is 15, an elevator 15, 15, speech? right? Here, you get about three, four minutes to get in the elevator. <laughs> so let's split the difference. So <laughs> let's say. I don't know. It's about working with the community, working with employers, engaging students, mm-hmm. um, relationships mm-hmm. that you form or have formed, um, and just really circling the whole process. But you have to know what the whole process is. And what? it's all about starting from, it's about, it's really a business plan. <laughs> <laughs> it all starts with the business plan and, and about, you know, uh, figuring out the center, which is the student, and everything that goes around to support the student in their effort for the job. I opened one medical assistant program. I helped open the sonography program, which kind of correlates in the radiology department to the imaging academy. Yep. You know, and there's still folks around that I had contracted with. You mm-hmm. know, um, not that I do that with them, mm-hmm. but um, but my reputation out in the community. Mm-hmm. It says there. everything. And, you know, then I opened another program up. So I had started from walking in the door to ordering the books to starting the business development to get out. And I actually had more people come to my advisory board than the automotive department did. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking it to those guys. Yeah. It, was a com- it, was a, it was a competition. <laughs> but it was also part of the relationship Absolutely. and the networking that I do. And I go to their networking events and and stay engaged with what they're doing that, you know, there's always a piece there that comes back or can come back to you. So it's all about, a lot of it is just the years of experience in the building. I'm a builder. A, You're a builder. I'm and a, a builder. connector. And I'm a connector. I love to build things. <laughs> um, and I love to see, they're like children, really. <laughs> it's just I don't have to pay for them. <laughs> Hey folks, welcome to another Resiliency Roundtable with the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. My name is Ed Fiennes, I'm the content specialist here for the NRC. You'll be hearing my voice, you'll be hearing the voice of communications specialist Alexander Scheinert and our big time guest. It's Faith Callert, job developer for Sayak County Community College in Patterson, New Jersey. And quite frankly, what you're going to get in short is a crash course in exactly how a job developer does their job incredibly well. Frankly, I think it's also a crash course in how anyone does any job incredibly well. Uh, resiliently, if dare I say, I mean, without hyperbole, like it's, it is, it is about getting your card in people's hands, getting your ear to a phone and just legwork doesn't even come close to the, to the degree to which um, faith uh, gets into the community and muscles a community together. And in some, in some cases, quite often, you know, people come willingly and she really has built something quite incredible uh, over in Patterson. So uh, we couldn't be prouder and applaud louder for uh, for Faith. So we wanted to get her on on the airwaves, as it were, and into your eardrums. So uh, without further ado, this is Faith Callert on the Resiliency Roundtables for the Northeast Resiliency Consortium. Uh, all right. So to begin with, we've been starting all of these podcasts in sort of a similar place, and I want to do that here. What makes a resilient job developer? Hmm. Somebody that thinks outside the box. Okay. What kind of box? When you're thinking of a box, what is that box like? What does a job developer have to do? To what is it? What box could a job developer be in that they would need to get out of? So if you're, tra- I'll give you an example. Good. Okay. So I worked with an EMT company um, 
and it was for a student who was trained as an EMT and an EMD. And they were looking to hire a dispatcher, but they wanted experience. So I spoke to them about creating a dual role, an EMT, EMD position, Mm -hmm. and hiring this young gentleman. Mm -hmm. And then training him in the the dispatch piece for on the job because he already had the EMT. Mm -hmm. And then when it was slow and he needed... And they needed an extra EMT to go out on the road because somebody called out sick. Mm -hmm. They had both the best of both worlds, so they created a position. So that's thinking outside the box. When I worked um, on the first grant here, which was the HCTI grant, um, we were trying to find phlebotomy um, positions. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to get into exam one. So I went on LinkedIn and I contacted somebody that was down south. Mm -hmm. I was able to go back and forth in conversation and explain what we were doing. And she gave me the direct number to the person that was up in New Jersey. Hmm. So I had to go somewhere else to get back to the goal here. And then when I spoke to them about the mobile phlebotomist, our folks didn't have all those pieces that they needed. So then I went back to the director and we started um, individual training model modules to enhance the original program mm-hmm. so then they would qualify for that position and be able to go through the screening process and the testing process to go in. So thinking outside the box, mm-hmm. you know, you might have one piece, but in the medical, you need sometimes to be able to have more than one piece. So how do you accomplish that with that one training module? That's a Because a job developer, I mean, uh, my baseline understanding before I joined the grant was like that. It sounds like you're creating jobs more i mean develop you're positions. literally you're literally developing you're changing the, something in the community and then bringing a student into it it almost sounds like that's right yeah that's some of the things that i do because i think outside the box <laughs> but there's more there too. is there can is. you tell us more about the other kinds of things that fall into that category? um so for instance when we started the emd program on the second grant that i was here we started emd i didn't know what emd was i called up the gentleman that was running the program to get an overview of exactly what they were doing i went up there to watch them so i can get an overview of what they were doing because i'm like i'm medical but that doesn't mean i can't um embrace other training programs. It's just getting the education for it. So then I said, okay, I need to introduce myself to people that would be hiring that, um, these type of folks. So what I did was call every uh, police department in Bergen, uh, Hudson, <laughs> Essex, introduce myself, and was, I was emailing them. I, any, any type of information I could give them. So they were doing newsletters up at the PSA once in a while. Mm-hmm. I would email that out. They contact me. I have a candidate. I would send the candidate to mm-hmm. get enrolled. You know, mm-hmm. we, we had the reciprocity type of relationship. So when I called up and left a message, hi, it's Faith Callard from Passaic County Community College. They'd call me back and say, hey, Faith, what's up? Looking at your hiring? No. Okay. Don't forget to email me when you do. So... Because of the relationship that I had, I did a workshop on filling out an application. So I had gotten a couple applications. Of course, one of them was 45 pages that I show in a workshop this way. Their understanding on this process that might get in their way and they're well aware of what they hoops they have to go through just to complete an application prior to getting an interview. Mm -hmm. And they sit there and it's like, Deers in the headlight. They're looking at me. I said, aren't you glad that I'm showing you what you have to do? And I said, on the back end, once you fill this out, you're going to print two pages and you're going to fill one out in pencil. Then you're going to put it in ink and then you're going to bring it up. You're going to put it in an envelope and you're going to put my name in there. This way they know you come from our school because I have that association with those employers. Do people know what job developers do and how, what has it been like forging those relationships because you know you were like oh i i called every police department in bergen has this county like i had a phone latched in my head they know my name yeah like what what is it what is it like i mean are people just like you know the kinds of employers that you're engaging with because we're talking about employer engagement here what what is that what has that been like um for me yeah it's just time consuming okay i'm very good about building relationships Mm -hmm. So once I build that relationship, I just don't take, as I've said. I always then say, what can I do for you? 
or if there's something that I could do for you, please reach back out to me. And if there's something directly that I can't accomplish for you, mm -hmm. and I have to go somewhere else, I will go that second step or that third step. And if I can't find the answer, I will certainly communicate that with you. So what's a give back? What's, a, what's something That's that you That's my give would, back. What, the, so something like that. Right. Okay. So for instance, I always um, connect other people in my network. Oh. Like employer to employer connect? Yeah, or? companies, okay. yes. right. Do you have an example? Okay, so um, we work with Eva's Village, Eva's culinary program. Mm -hmm. And I was at a job fair. This didn't come to fruition, but I was at a job fair and I saw edible arrangements there. And they were looking to hire folks. But as I had a conversation with them, they were looking to oh, uh, bring in a line of baked goods. So I knew that Eva's Kitchen had just opened up their business end of it, Eva's Baked, uh, Eva's Baked Goods and Cookies. So I spoke to them. I gave Donna Fico the name of the person to, to reach out to in edible arrangements, and this guy had seven stores. Mm. Because not only could it have been local, it could have gone national, But and then they had to bring it up to the board, and I don't think it went any further. But that was an opportunity missed on their end to expand that business and then employ others to be able to if they went national. Okay. So now Patterson Public Health has a green garden here in Patterson. Mm -hmm. So I brought the health educator down to meet with the um, chef down in Eva's to see how the green they garden in Patterson and they can get um, you know, the benefits of the green garden from the kitchen produce. or the fact, the produce, or mm -hmm. the fact that if the grant renews that maybe they can start a green garden with the grant mm -hmm from um, the public health department. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of bring the people in our fold and wrap them around each other. For instance, Eva's had gone with the baked goods. That would have opened that whole business up to right. employ other folks, which would have been our graduates. Mm -hmm. If they go with the Green Garden, maybe they can start another class in their program on mm -hmm. environmental environmental so. gardening or uh, those all the the fresh market uh, market fresh restaurants okay. to be and that can also go into something if they think outside the box mm -hmm. to an entrepreneurial class on how to open up a fresh market business. I I think outside the box. So people like don't always take the ideas, but I think about them. What's it like to really work? for a connect at, a, at an employer. For an so for instance, I've been doing education now for about 16 years in many different aspects. Sure, we can uh, talk about that too. I like The that only thing well. that I really haven't done was uh, financial aid. Not that I couldn't because I did do uh, the business end in the you doctor's were office a math for five person. years. <laughs> yes, I am a math person and I did do uh, all the medical uh, billing and collections because I was a coder. Oh, okay. So uh, I cleaned them up, made them a lot of money, and it was a beautiful thing, and I was there for five years. Uh, and that's how I ended up going into teaching, because I answered an ad to teach medical billing and coding. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. handed me a book and said, see you Monday, and I'm like, really? <laughs> that's um, that's easier. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and that's where my real educational journey with adults started, by answering that ad. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, go back to the question again. Um, What's have you come across a tough nut to crack, and what is what is that? What do you act? Wh how do you crack that nut? I mean, persistence. If you, if you, so that's that's the ticket, just over and over and over again. Right, because it's building relationship that relationship. Building. Yeah. So, for instance, when I first started doing this type of work in one of the pieces of the job that I did, mm -hmm. um, St. Joe's. The first time I tried to do a contract with St. Joe's. St. Joe's Hospital. Yes, yeah, yeah. six months. They kept blowing me off and uh, they were not engaging. And I just had said to them, what do I have to do other than coming down there and physically introducing myself and having a meeting to make this move forward? Hmm. So we finally made it move forward and then I had moved on to another school and the next time I did the contract took two weeks. So now I'm working with them with the community health worker. Um, St. Joe's is coming in Wednesday to present to the class. Nice. And uh, this is the woman that does that work out in the, the community. They have not really um, developed this community health worker in the hospital yet because I've been working with them with phone calls since mm -hmm. August. We're waiting for the new director to come on to then have a subsequent meeting mm -hmm. um, to map out 
and see what their needs are the, in the hospital and then align that up to the programming that we're doing here now that it's gone into the Associates Nav Navigator, mm -hmm. which I hope that I will be part of to help developing this process because I'm very good in developing and molding and because that's part of my background is. With the uh, curriculum aligning with the needs of the employer. Right. I, mm -hmm. I've started two programs in my life from the first needle, <laughs> the first employee. <laughs> Um, no, I actually say three because I also worked with an, um, sonography and I w went mm. out and uh, had a pri every student had to have a placement to be enrolled. So in six months, I ended up with 30 places, which was not easy. If I'm coming in as a job developer, totally green, what's one thing that I need to watch out for? What's the, sort of the one pitfall that you would say I would need to? Organization. To, organization. You have to be very organized. You have to, I, I'm a still a paper old school document, so I keep notes. I have folders on every place that I work with, and every mm -hmm. time I speak to them, I make a note in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, people use the computer. It's whatever works for you. I am a paper person. I've old school, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, for instance, I had a conversation with somebody today and I opened the folder and I put it down. Mm -hmm. What I did, this way I know, and the, the turnaround, and I left it on different parts of my desk that I circle around. But it's organization, it's consistency, it's, it's really telling, you know, it's, uh, do what you say and say, say what you, do what you say and say what you do. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, just don't always take, what can I do for you? How can I help you in your mission? And it's sometimes just maybe introducing somebody to somebody. Would would advocacy fall into something that you do in terms of yeah, being an, is that the right word? Because that was something what looking through sort of the best practices, the, the uh, documents that we've been getting now at the sort of the third year of the grant, the, um, that's, that word came to my mind when mm -hmm. I was reading about what you had done. Um, is that what is it? I mean, is that is that am I touching on something there? Or? Well, you are an advocate for a program that's mm -hmm. launching. Sure. Okay, just like CHW was a new program here that we launched, and mm -hmm. when we did the first um, advisory board, mm -hmm. we really didn't know what to do with it yet. You know, well, what are, let's talk about advisory boards. Kind of what's for the people for the people at home listening at home. What's what's the role of an advisory board in all? Well, an advisory board, you, you uh, assemble a group of people that you think that will be involved in that training. Okay. So, for instance, I assembled an advisory board. There were about 35 people there. It was prior to you guys coming on. Well, that's a large group of people. Yeah. That was a large group of <laughs> people. Um, I did it in about a month and a half. It's just when I first came on. That was the first, second thing I was given to do. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't know what to do with community health worker, nor did anybody else. I'm still educating people on what a community health worker does out. And I'm mm -hmm. building, yep. you know, with partners. And I'm working with partners. Mm -hmm. So I had gone to a Medicare and Medicaid regional meeting up here at the um, library. And I took a former employee with me. I said, I'm going to work one side of the room and you're going to work the other side of the room. And all I want you to do is introduce yourself, say we're doing community health worker, ask for a card and point to me and tell them that I'll be back in touch with them. And I had a conversation with each and every one that we had a card with because I had I wanted to go in all different areas because I didn't really know who was going to employ these people. Yeah. So I had met a lot of great people up in that that came from different parts of the healthcare community to this meeting. Mm -hmm. Invited those. I went to um, some of the other uh, people that I have long-term relationships with and invited them to come for their, to give their input on what they know from their organization and how this will transcribe over as it grows with the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a lot of just, you know, speaking with people. So I had um, Planned Parenthood there. I had the hospital, St. Mary's came. I had St. Joe's there. I had the director of, um, uh, the uh, director of HR had come because hmm. I was also on an advisory board with her. So um, I reached out to many, many different ways. I had um, some long-term care facilities come. I had some nursing homes. Anybody that I could think of in the medical community that might be involved in this because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I didn't know really know where to go. 
So I just kind of made lists of which way to go, nonprofits, hospitals, um, nursing home, long-term facilities. I had Rite Aid there because actually they'll hire a community health worker for their wellness ambassador position. Yeah. Which after I had a conversation. Do they like flu shots mean? Or like something no, like they that? go around and do the education with the oh, like, with their tablet wellness. and help navigate people for their oh. needs and maybe bring them back to the pharmacy or bring them over. They're a health educator within. So, but employed by writing. Right. And instead of being a community health worker, they're called the wellness ambassador. Mm -hmm. And because I have the relationship mm -hmm. with these folks from running a farm tech program on another grant, I had invited them. I said, be open to this because this might be a great fill for your wellness ambassador. And they came in in the fall and presented jobs to the students. They're coming in again uh, to present the wellness ambassador. It's not a bad thing. It's like 11 or $12 to start, which is much higher than a farm tech will start with. Okay. So I also invited North Hudson Community Action Corp, which is a big clinic down here, although they'll only hire folks that have a degree but I wanted their input on it. And it was a lot of the people that I've worked with in my career mm -hmm. in the healthcare in different areas that I reached out to, to bring them in. And then they, Mike put together the agenda that he wanted to go over. And then they were breakdown tables. Hmm. So from that, um, some of the nonprofits are, are coming in to speak to them because I have somebody coming in at least once a week to speak to the students. Um, and actually, one of those folks, one of those organizations, mm -hmm. um, just interviewed one of my students and offered her $500 more a year than the going rate. And mm. she's starting Yay. as a community health worker. Yeah. That's exciting. One of the things that I hear you talking about, which I knew that this was a big piece of what you do as a job developer, is really kind of creating the visibility in the classroom, mm -hmm. getting the outside yep. community, but also your presence. Yep. And then you're doing that on the other side with the advisory mm -hmm. boards and also you know, right. meeting with people where it's your visibility, that it's right. a face, it's face. a name. Right. right. Mm. So can you talk a little bit more about how you do that? Because it seems so, it's always so genuine. You make it look easy, but <laughs> I know that's, that. That's what I was thinking. Like I you're like, I call these enough. people and they just think some magic happens. How do you do it? <laughs> well, What's it's all about the real well going to the employers it's about relationships mm -hmm. right so it's you know again it's a give and take it's not all just all about me mm -hmm. and it's also about explaining what we're doing here what our mission is how we're doing it and it's also my re mm -hmm. hard to say it's my reputation from doing this for many years yeah, you're consistent i'm going to an advisory board for valley hospital on thursday morning so i had called valley hospital up because some of our students who are not um, taking part of the um, Affordable Care Act insurance, right? Mm -hmm. But might need placement into the hospital. I negotiated rates for discounts on all the things that they needed, uh, shots and wow. all the different things with Valley Health System, which is all their freestanding doctor's offices, mm -hmm. right? And they will get a discounted rate because I, I'm signing an MOU with them instead hmm. of paying full amount. And they came back to me, I said, no, no, it's not good enough. I want Bergen's getting, so make sure you drop it down to Bergen, because I know they have a contract with you. <laughs> You're in the know. Yeah. So I did that Pull to help a stops. student who wants placement in a hospital and has to go through you know, a two-step PPD if the hospital's not paying for it, because some of the hospitals don't pay for this upfront. Hmm. The only one that still does is St. Mary's. So a lot of them we know have challenges with money and sure. income and you know, it's quite costly to go through this whole battery of tests and things that they have to do. So I negotiated to get them a better rate. Mm -hmm. And then they'll just go, it's gonna be on their computer system. All they have to do is mention they're a PCC student. So in saying that, part of what I, I'm planning to do is that is share that out with the radiography department, the nursing department, and bring that across the college-wise, mm -hmm. the negotiation rate I, I had gotten. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping to do that also with St. Joe's, but I'm still in that, not up in that process. Mm -hmm. So Valley Health System was one of the folks that I used in another school mm -hmm. uh, where I was. And it's a relationship that I, 
um, actually called one of the offices because I couldn't find the gentleman's number. And she's like, Faith, how are you? And I'm like, good. She's like, we have to go out to dinner. I'm like, we will. <laughs> Another wow. example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I will. I will. I, I told her I was going to be bronze. away. And when I come Seriously. back, I'm going to be slammed. So, And her husband was having surgery. So I will reach out to her at the end of the month just to continue my relationship and say, when are we going out? Mail me some dates. Mm. You know, and that's off hours. And that's just a relationship that continued from all these years yeah. so go, let's go to the student side mm -hmm. I start with orientation so when I'm doing my orientation um, orientation is you. you you sort of run orientation no, or we, do, we all do parts the intake parts. process okay. I don't okay. do the intake either that's someone else that's Nicole right um, so at orientation I make them put my name my name in there my email in there and the office phone number and they need to email me at orientation so that I know that they did it. Hmm. This way, when I call them, I want my name to come up. I said, you could put a butterfly. You could put any nice little picture in there. <laughs> as long as it's my name. Yeah. As long as my name comes up and you know it's me. Because if you don't answer me when I have a hot thing going on or I need to speak to you, you've missed an opportunity that you normally would not be able to have it be taken advantage of. Right. Hmm. So I say, I'm a, I'm a very important person to your life. And I said, and if you open up and you embrace everything that we're giving you, we're here to help you. Most mm -hmm. people don't have these pieces. Mm -hmm. And if you don't take advantage of it, shame on you. Yeah, but it's also back to the relationships. Yeah. And you set that expectation from the beginning right. that they need to put the value on the relationship right. they have with you. And I mean, it, it's true right. to who you are and the relationships that you're doing and maintaining in the community. But do you find that it's hard to engage, can keep students engaged throughout their process, even if you start strong like that in the beginning? Well, the, I'm always in and out of the classroom. Like last night I walked in with PSC and Gia said, who remembers who I am? <laughs> How many hands went up? Most of them. Yep. Faith. <laughs> I'm like, we're good. <laughs> and I said, I'm tr I ask the women in the PSE&G that I'm doing dress or success or community health worker and I'm inviting them in and would they like to come and yes and nice. then I'm setting up something hopefully in Hudson County to take the guys up there with one of the other grants because I said well we might as well go together and coordinate the efforts and take the men up there because I did send two men up uh, two of my graduates up there and made an appointment for them so they can go through the program up there and get suited up. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm trying to work with another grant here and we'll go together and do that. I just emailed him and I, got, I received confirmation from students last night because we were away and they just started and yeah. trying to wrap around all of my efforts at one time. So um, yeah, so um, just being visible and then you know with the quarter reporting, we're, I'm calling them or Rashida's mm -hmm. calling them. Um, we're on the phone with them. Right. Emailing them, calling them. We have the free text. I just haven't had enough time to be used. I use that once in a while, mm -hmm. uh, but texting them. But I call them, and part of my plan is, which made me very successful on HCTI. No, I'm sorry, HPOG, which we were number one for two, three years now. Wow. Um, HPOG, what does that stand for? Uh, Health Professional Opportunity Grant. That was the Another. second grant I was on. I was the number one job developer on there for two years, and when mm -hmm. I left there to come here, uh, they only had like six or seven people to make their number, and I gave them a list of people that were pending. <laughs> and uh, the email that I did receive from Janet last week is that we're still number one in the state. Wow. There you go. And I said, thank you for including me. She goes, nope, you're part of the team. You always will be. You mentioned your students, uh, something about uh, knowing where your students' lives are. It isn't just that person is in the building that's a student that's like a, a, a kind of a whole person um can you talk about i mean as broadly or specifically as you can about kind of your role in their lives because you're really talking about their whole lives in, in many ways i think and telling them that your relationship with them right well I, put, I plan that out in orientation because mm -hmm. i make them also tell me about themselves okay <laughs> You, you know, make them. You get in their faces no, and point at them. That's the third them. slide. It's your turn. I just told you where it's I came from. Intrusive advising it's your turn. 101. Mm -hmm. here. Oh, quid pro quo. That works. Right. Yeah, I, I and I said, it. when you come back and on the first day of class, you're not going to all be staring at each other like you're afraid of each other. Now you had that warm, fuzzy feeling that I started with you here today. <laughs> 
breaking the ice. <laughs> I was a teacher. This is warm and fuzzy. Yeah, yeah I was a teacher. So, you know. You know what that's like. When I, every day I would put a puzzle up on the board and they would have to figure out the puzzle. And they, I would do a lot of team building when I was doing law classes. And I'd make them put together and they'd have to kind of model after the apprentice. Mm-hmm. And there was oh, always a project right. manager and mm. they somebody always had a lead. So this way you encourage that shy person to kind, kind of come out and not always rely on people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to all take turns and you all have to learn how to step up. So that was a lot of team building. But I start with orientation and I do go right over all the expectations. And then I go about what it is to be a grant funded student and how lucky you are. It's a scholarship. And these are the things that I will need from you. Hmm. It's on my PowerPoint. It's in the papers that I give them in the copy. Mm-hmm. So the things there are spelled out. And if I, you know, getting back to HPOG, one mm-hmm. of the things I'm going to start doing with, although I'm here two nights a week, I'll be staying a little bit later and calling students at night because that's the way you get somebody who's working during the day who yeah. won't pick up the phone. Yeah. And that's one of the things I used to do in HPOG. I used to stay two nights a week and call people at night. Hmm. So simple. Yeah, because you know the terms in which students are communicating mm-hmm. or when they And if they it's raining, it's great because they're not out in the community with <laughs> their kids. <laughs> <laughs> they got to be home. Because they're not out on sports. And yeah. you, somebody that's working that can't answer the phone during the day will answer the phone after 5 o'clock. So you have to be available to think outside the box on how to accomplish your job. And I never shared that with too many people, but now we'll be out in the universe. <laughs> outside the box, Outs- once again. She always outside. Again. How do you accomplish your goals? I'm a very problem solving oriented person, and how do you accomplish your goals? I will wake somebody up at 8 30 in the morning. I'll come in and call them right away. I'll wake them up. Good morning. How are you? It's Faith. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure I should. I, I think I'd love I've for got you one of those that. calls before. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also communication. You know, like I just spoke to the chair of the radiology department who dropped something off and we exchanged student information. And, you know, it's a, I I'll probably be meeting with her, you know, um, in the next month just to go over where they are. And it's about communication and working with people and having mutual respect and working together, you know. Do you have a student story of any kind that kind of exemplifies either something that was kind of a a longer road to hoe? It was a really kind of a tough thing that you may have either overcome or it just didn't end up happening. Or, again, a superstar, some sort of like someone to just kind of like some kind of story that that you think might sort of kind of tell the story of what you do. That highlights just how important the role that you have in their lives. Well, that was that gentleman I told you about, Jason. Mm -hmm. He actually was in our first press conference here that Mm -hmm. we had. And he's a veteran. He's an EMT. He went through our EMT program. Mm -hmm. He was very proactive, staying engaged with me all times. Mm -hmm. Even when his mother was in the hospital, he was calling me. (laughs) And um, he obtained a job up in Bergen County. And there's a process. You have um, 90 days and another 90 days, and you go through a long probationary period where each hurdle you go through, then you get a bump up in pay. Mm -hmm. So it's about a six-month process, and you're not making much money. So he was doing that job for the hours he gave him. He was still working in Monarch in the state as an EMT, has a family. He called me up, and he said, I was finally made full-time. I'm, and he says, I'm so excited. I'm so happy that you were with me all the way on this journey and encouraging me and checking in on me. Even after the fact that um, he was past our, not our um, three time, you know, the three quarters. After completion. I still kept sending him an email, how you doing? Or as I spoke to the director who runs that, I'm like, how are my folks doing? Go down the road and tell me what's going on with who and whatever. And, and if something's going on, he call, would call me. Mm-hmm. And that's part of that employment relationship. Because um, I always said, let me know if I have to come up there. Because <laughs> I have no, I used to always say to students, if I'm walking down the hallway and you didn't tell me, that's not good. <laughs> Sometimes I have to do an, inter- I would have years ago have to do interventions. But I always say, if I have to come up and we have, and we have down, that's cool. I'll do that too. 
there's something about the the I think the re, the retention via communication. Mm -hmm. This is so. I mean, you're in my mind. It sounds like you're training them. You're actually doing the most amount of job training, as much job training as the course is itself. That that you create sort of this net of ob not obligation and it's sort of like they're sort of bound to you in any kind of way but they want to kind of work for you like it's work sometimes to pick up the phone to answer an email accountability that, yeah that there's someone there who is busting their butt <laughs> for you and that they're going to say okay i need to meet them at least part of the way in terms of an effort and over time the checking in right and then they check back right. like that's the kind of thing that i mean a lot of students i mean i wouldn't i don't want to take that for granted mm -hmm. um and pointing or maybe it's not even a question but just sort of like pointing it's so it out. transferable then to the workforce to their lives and i know that you've talked about the impact that the relationships that they build in this kind of setting with you has an effect on how they mm -hmm. communicate with their families or the personal relationships their children's they're, teachers right. their doctors the, right. if they're the, if, if they're taking care of a, a an elderly parent or loved one or someone like keeping up with their doctors and their kids doctors like that accountability like, yeah exactly well i always i tell them i'm i am watching you from day one <laughs> <laughs> so when i call you on the phone and there's this music on there that is right the playback tone <laughs> The first thing I'm going to say, hi, it's Faith. Change your voicemail and call me back. <laughs> yeah. I, I, send I keep the message it real. I have, a lot, I have a lot of those, a lot of the first email conversations right. with, like, again, yeah. somebody has like, a, a borderline offensive email yeah. address right. that they made when they were 13 because they thought it was funny. Yeah. Like, it's not funny anymore. You're going to be sending, it's like, yeah, I mean, fine, I'm your philosophy professor, but, you know. You're going to try to send a, a, a resume from mm -hmm. this email address? You're not, you can't do this. Well, it's, that's the next thing. When I see an email yeah. or the girls make a spreadsheet on the computer for me when I'm going through it mm -hmm. because I make contact mm -hmm. lists that I blast everybody with. Yeah. Um, and I see an email I don't like. The first thing I do on the phone is I get on the phone and say, oh, you need to change your email and I need a new email. by." And I give them, I give them deadlines mm -hmm. because if you don't give people a deadline then they're gonna blow you up so I need this done by this date it's called accountability and I always say I am like your boss so you do say that yeah okay so I wasn't I wasn't the same thing about I wasn't noticing yeah right. the student, res the student <laughs> right. resilience I am yeah. like your boss and I you know for me to endorse you you need to work with me and show me your shining star hmm. I mean I'll work with everybody I send people up for interviews and I tell the employers, I will send you no more than five candidates that I've pre-screened due to the fact of what you've told me, mm -hmm. okay? I'm not gonna send them 10, that's too many choices and then I don't wanna give them that many choices. Right. I want them to know that I screen them to their, by having a conversation with the student, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm not giving them an abundance of choices. And then, um, I tell them they need to interview that person for the best fit into their organization because it's really them finding the best fit that will work with their culture and mm -hmm. with the skills that they need. Mm -hmm. So really people get hired by fitting into the culture and the best fit with their organization. But you, you've actually altered uh, some organizations <laughs> to Absolutely. fit your students. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And I'll give you another uh, an example. Yeah. I work with Community <laughs> Blood Services. Yeah. They're up in northern New Jersey. When I was in another school, they would work with us by taking, I started the internship workplace learning with them. I was one of the first schools to mold their workplace learning. And uh, they would come in and do blood drives in the school, mm -hmm. back and forth, right? And I would also bribe the uh, auto guys by providing them breakfast. <laughs> Sidebar. Hey, no, from, from my budget, I would go buy <laughs> squeaky breakfast. wheels, get grease. Yep, yep got to make it's them all happen. about the food. <laughs> yep, it was all about guys and food yeah. and breakfast. Yeah. And they were allowed to come on my side of the world because otherwise, if I saw them on my side of the world, I'd go back to your side. <laughs> You're not allowed on this side. They were not allowed. To, I had mostly women, and they were automotive. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a position. Um, well, they would take, um, they, they 
took their, they had a dispatcher position, but they were only looking at medical assistance. So my relationship to them and uh, speaking to her about the EMD program, and I referred up to her, their organization, folks that had some medical background prior to going to EMD. So they mm-hmm. hired a couple of folks into those positions. Yeah. You're educating employers now. I'm, I'm re-educating qualifications that would make somebody qualified for that other than what they just think. So yes. it's thinking outside of the box <laughs> yes. again. You're sensing a theme? And then yes. there was another student who was an EMT that had a biology background that I knew from looking at his resume that he ended up getting another position up there as yeah. some sort of lab something that they loved. Yeah. So I took translatable skills, current training, and I can, if I see something, I can direct somebody in that direction too. And mm. from the relationship, they get pulled and they get reviewed and they get an interview. Yeah. And I have a conversation with 99% of them prior to they going up for an interview. What's your elevator speech? And that starts with orientation too. I show them what an elevator speech is. I give them, 25 questions that they need to sit down with a pad and answer so they can answer questions on an interview. Mm -hmm. I work with the CHW and the EIF teacher to do a lot of work on the ground for me because of how busy my schedule is. And then I get them in for review. I give them all the pieces to put things together for me, resumes. Okay. And that's part of their class. Hmm. And then they send them to me. Part of career coach that we brought on is when I have a student that can't articulate what they did on the job, which I also told them to do, Mm -hmm. put the job title in, print it out, give them a highlighter, have them highlight what they did on that job. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes they don't have the the comfort to be able to articulate what they actually did. They're in writing, especially in writing. But if they see it and they can highlight it, then we can put that together for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, It's funny. I mean, like you talk about, I mean, maybe I'm picking on this. Too much, but like the idea of being outside the box, it's it, just by applying common sense. There's like there's no boxes. <laughs> like there's boxes seem so pointless because it all you're doing is simply communicating on a on a on a very real and large scale. Yeah, and it's and it's and it's maintaining that relationship until uh, that accountability is developed and it's, and it's and all sort of in all points, sort of on the employer side and on the student side and even on the instructor side. Because again, you're asking you're asking instructors to do something, which you know again you you mentioned sort of as an aside, but like that that's a lot of what community colleges are are people that are handed textbooks and like bye yeah like the sort of there's no there's no teacher training there's no uh, so in essence you've mm-hmm. kind of become an instructor on all three fields within this sort of you know network that community college a community college programming like we're talking about continuing education adult learners a form you have your educators you have your instructors and you have your students and you are actually teaching all of them <laughs> in and some the employers fashion. yeah that's the thing employers the you're community. teaching all three of them how uh, really about sort of keeping a network together so you've actually formed a hub you know in in the job developments on the job development side and that is i think a very it's it's i don't know if it's unique i mean you can tell me if that's unique but like i would hope every job development department or office does that does that because it's just it seems almost too commonsensical and too obvious to not be that but it's so yeah but that also comes from my background Okay. Okay. So I was an instructor. I was a director of education. I used to go out and train other directors of education. I used to train. I used to train the trainers. So I used to train my instructors on how I want them to deliver things. But of course, they can do what other things. They don't have to always stay in my box. But one of the places I worked, the my boss got busy, so he would send me out in other schools. When the after the executive quit they used to send me and put me in as the executive (laughs) you know if i promoted had somebody promoted one of my instructors because i went to another campus and she was falling behind and on a friday night i went down with the executive director who was always very good to me and i sat there and i helped clean her up all her paperwork everything she had to do we sat there probably till 12 o'clock that night (laughs) because i felt responsible because i had her promoted not too many people do that anymore. No, and that's exactly the kind of thing you were talking about with your students where you're like, I'm only going to send five resumes. Right. That like, that's me. That's my face on those yeah. five resumes. Right. Not just, obviously it's your students and you're backing them up completely, but just by 
again, you've already laid the groundwork by working with the students on such an intrusive level, not in a bad way, <laughs> you know, an intrusive level, you know, 8.30 it's in the morning, intrusive. Yeah, exactly. It, like, that, but like that becomes... I don't like that word. Oh, well, yeah, me neither. It always sounds so negative. Uh, but it like does. surgery, like intrusive yeah. surgery. But like the, 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 you're kind of walking alongside them at all times so that you are actually with them in that first... I can't imagine what that first interview is like for somebody coming out of... You know, uh, like after after you know you've put them through the ringer, like that first interview must be that much more. I mean, they're still gonna be ner- it's still gonna be nerve wracking. Right. They're still maybe. Have oh your my students God. talked about it? Yeah. Oh, what do yeah. they What do they, they come tell back you and talk that to you they about? feel For more instance, prepared. The, uh, PSC and G gentleman and the um, CHW. She does mock interviews in the classroom with him, and I told her have everybody rate everybody in the classroom, mm-hmm. the good, the bad. I also do that when we go to job fairs and students accompany me to job fairs. We've gone over the elevator speech in the hallway. I sit there and I watch them. I was and then I that, critique yeah. them. Mm-hmm. And I said, we're going to grow from the critique. For the first one you do, you're going to be really nervous. By the time we're done at the whole fair, you're going to be a pro. And I tell them, look in the mirror, practice, write it out. Make yourself comfortable with what you're saying because the more you practice, the better you'll yeah. come off as it's coming sincerely, not that you practice it. You own it. You want to be able to own it. You want it to come su- sincere. You want it to be real and show your passion. Has there been any pushback from students? Have you ever had like somebody who was just like who just couldn't get over that hump? Yes. Yeah. What's that? So I'd, I'd love to hear about what that's like. She, she could not take – it wasn't on this grant – constructive mm-hmm. criticism. So we all sat down with her as a team. Okay. Mm. Or I was even thinking of someone who was just too shy, who just couldn't, who was good enough at the job, smart enough at the job, but just could not get over either stage fright or just embarrassment talking to strangers. Like Using those just, skills. You, yeah. keep, you keep trying and sometimes they will and sometimes they just won't, but they'll find the place. But it will take them longer and sometimes people will never do that. I've had mm-hmm. students come running into my office, not on this grant, where they had a job interview. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, all right, pad, paper, write it out. We're <laughs> going to practice. How do you teach someone that failure is okay? That, in fact, failure is a part of learning. So you step back, and what did I learn from that? And how am I going to change it the next time around? But yeah. you, a student has to buy into that change. Mm-hmm. Me telling them is just another adult telling them something they don't want to hear. Be a, another how do you get them to be reflective about what they're experiencing? What, yeah. Well, then you Especially say, if they're what cynical. are your real goals? What are your real goals here? Do you really? And then I'll say, do you really want to go to work? Do you really want to obtain a job or not? Or what is your real plan? Because eventually you're going to have to stand on your own feet. But they have to buy into it. Mm-hmm. Because as an adult, it's just mommy and daddy telling them the same thing they didn't want to hear all along. Uh, and it's also part of the screening process when the student comes into the program if they really want to do this or they're mm-hmm. just doing it because somebody told Understanding them Understanding their intentions from the beginning. Have you, have you actually had those conversations with this isn't for you conversations? That you when you ask them what's your plan and they're like, oh. Like, sure have they told me, yeah, they don't really want And then I said, why did you enroll in the program? Right. I mean, it's like that. that's a, again, it would And seem... then I'll say, what's your next step? Because I, right. at the end of a program, I physically get on the phone with somebody and I, we do an exit plan. What's that? What do you mean? Tell us more about what that is. Yeah. Um, well, their resumes are all done. I talk to them every two weeks about their strategy. I'm looking for jobs. I send out job leads. If um, I have... If I'll send out a job lead, I'll hand the list to Rashid and I'll say, call each one of these folks and let me know if they applied. Mm. Extending that reach beyond finishing the program and keeping that relationship going. So if a dispatcher job comes up and I have a list of people that have not obtained a job yet, right? Mm -hmm. I'll email it out to them. I hand the list to Rashid and I go call them up and find out if they're applying. And if they're applying, they need to let me know, as I've told them, in orientation. Because then once I know that they put their application in, I will call the chief of police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then their application that was on the bottom was pulled up on the top. Mm -hmm. And 99% of the time, they'll at least get an interview because of the relationship. Always. (laughs) 
the golden rule. <laughs> yeah, the word keeps coming up over and over again. It's about relationships. Yeah. Like if I need something, I will call some one of my other network contract contacts and say, this is what I'm doing. Can you give me some direction? Or if not, do you know if somebody can give me direction? It's about relationship. Give me that back and forth. For more on the Northeast Resiliency Consortium, stick around here on our SoundCloud page. We got plenty of more podcasts to go and plenty of podcasts here in the hopper. If you want something of the written variety, we are starting to upload documents to our Skills Commons page. So you can go to skillscommons.org and type Northeast Resiliency Consortium into the search box. There's a couple there already. And since we are in the, the home stretches of our tax grant, uh, there'll be plenty more to come, I promise. Uh, if you'd like a monthly update on what's going on with the Northeast Resiliency Consortium, you can subscribe to our newsletter. You can go to www.northeastresiliency.org and uh, click on the link that's there. So for Alex and Faith, my name is Ed Fiennes, and we will see you here relatively soon.